Thank you very much, everyone, for coming along tonight. And thanks to those that are joining us online as well. Uh, my name is Lisa McKenzie. I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager at EMEC. You might have been expecting Neil Kermode tonight, but he's taking a very well-deserved holiday, um, so you've got me hosting instead. Uh, very brief housekeeping. We're not expecting a fire alarm tonight, so if the fire alarm does go off, the exit is behind us here or out through the, the door that we came through, and the restrooms are just out to the right um, outside the door we came through. Um, very delighted to welcome John and Andrea here to give a presentation on motion energy today. So we've got John Clark, Head of Projects, and Andrea Cayo, Business Development Manager. They're going to speak to us about the Blue X Wave Energy Technology, um, sharing how testing in Orkney, both at EMEC and currently off the east coast of Orkney mainland, has been instrumental to their technology development, but also their approach to commercialisation. So they're going to be delving into the past, present and future of motion energy. And without any further ado, I'll just pass over to them for the presentation. Yes. Testing. There we are. That's on. Can we get the slides up? There we go. Welcome. Uh, thanks for coming out on a November Tuesday evening. Um, I'm just going to do some introductions to ourselves. So uh, presenting tonight will be Andrea Cayo, our business development manager, who's part of the commercial team at Motion, who are responsible for raising money and bringing in customers. Uh, my name's John Clark. I'm head of projects at Motion, and I'm largely responsible for spending all of that money. Um, so we're going, we're going to divide the presentation into three parts. Um, a little bit about motion energy and our technology, uh, a bit about past and current projects, so what we've been up to in Orkney over the past two or three years, and then we'll finish off with a bit about the future, what, what's next. So I'll hand over to Andrea, who will start and tell us a bit about motion. There's the, there's the doodah. That's it. Microphone okay? Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks for being here, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, I admit that this is only my second trip to Orkney, so I'm a bit of a newbie, but hopefully one of many more. Um, so kicking off with just a little bit about motion. So a bit about the context of the company and just the context of wave energy. A lot of you will know the latter or most of the latter, but we'll just whiz through. So motion was founded in 2015 and we consider ourselves a second generation wave energy company. So we are taking some of the lessons from previous wave energy experiences, both technical and commercial, and trying to do a little bit different um, to our commercial approach and our roadmap and our technology development. So one of Motion's co-founders is uh, Chris Retzler, and he was the principal scientist at Palamis. So we have some of that knowledge in-house that we're trying to build on, um, and we're lucky to have him. So yeah, we've we've got over 10 million uh, pounds of investment so far, and a lot of it has come through public funding. Uh, but now we're really on the cusp of commercializing, and so we're ramping up on the the private side and the industry uh, side of things. So the, the device you see here, maybe you've seen it on Hudson Pier, maybe you've seen it in the sea. Uh, I actually have not seen it in the sea yet. So if you have, I'll, I'm quite jealous. Um, so we developed this, it's called Blue X. it's our first prototype. It's a 10 kilowatt rated device, so it's relatively small. Um, we deployed it uh, for the first time in 2021, and it's now back in the water for a, a bit of a, an extended scope trial that we'll come to in a second. Um, we're a team of, I think that's out of date, 20, 20 something, I think more than 23. Uh, we seem to be growing all the time, uh, got lots of nationalities in the company, which is great. Uh, and yeah, we're very proud of our Scottish heritage. So the genesis of motion 
was Edinburgh University and a lot of our activities and what we do so far has been in Scotland and will remain as well. We're looking to expand elsewhere, but the core of our activity will, re will remain in Scotland. Um, and yeah, we, we're really passionate about waves, about commercializing wave energy technology and using it to enable sustainability. So a word that we've recently learnt and become quite fond of is, and John is going to laugh at my pronunciation, Funko Flauta. Does anyone, <laughs> there he is. Does anyone, has anyone heard this word before or no at all? Yeah. So it's a German word and the literal translation is dark doldrums or dark wind lull. Um, and what it really refers to is a period of time during which the sun isn't shining as much and the wind isn't blowing as much. And so you have a, a lull in, in energy. And what's, why is it relevant? It's relevant because as grids become more renewable, um, diversification of the renewable energy mix is going to become more and more important. And that's because introducing uh, energies like wave or tidal to a, a grid that is typically now dominated by wind and solar means we can balance supply and demand a bit more because these resources are all complementary or largely complementary. Um, and so we can better match supply and demand. And it means we don't have to build up our grid as much. We can save on some of the energy storage requirements on the emissions and the associated costs as well. So there's a growing number of studies now that are modeling, and it, it, it's not an easy thing to model, but the system benefit of a diversified grid. Um, one of these efforts is the Evolve project of, I think these slides will be distributed. Um, and one of these studies is looking at the Orkney grid in particular. Um, wave energy is relatively predictable and consistent compared to wind and solar. Um, sometimes there are issues, and this is especially true in islands, for example, where you have limited land mass, so solar becomes a little bit more constrained, or you might have, you might not want the visual impact of a big wind energy turbine. And this is true, for example, in, in the Caribbean, we're seeing this a lot. And the other thing to say is that wave energy has a variety of uses across different scales of power. So from the tens of kilowatts to the hundreds to the megawatts. And so there's kind of broad market relevance and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. And so across the blue economy, which encompasses a lot of offshore energy provision, um, it's, it's really important, but it's really challenging as well. So the three huge challenges are the cost of the energy. So wave energy, technology is still relatively immature, surviving at sea, and it's quite capital intensive to be, build these wave energy converters. So um, it's a lot of it is hardware and a lot of it does, does, does cost. But I always like to think of, there's a quote by Stephen Salter, Professor Stephen Salter, who's one of the wave energy pioneers. Um, and he said something like, to complain about the dangerously high waves at a good wave site is akin to complaining about the high temperatures of a flame in a thermal plant. Now, in reality, the challenge is a bit more nuanced because in wave energy, you have to design your device to, you have to design it for the worst conditions, so the, the most extreme conditions. But in practice, you're getting a lot of, most of your energy yield through the, smaller, more frequently occurring waves. So it's not quite so simple, but it's it's a nice example. So we're very aware of these challenges and we're, we're trying to um, build up both commercially and through our technology to sort of address these, these challenges head on. So we decided to leave this slide in, although it's probably a repetition for a lot of you, um, but there's really a couple of takeaways. Wave energy in the UK kicked off in the 70s, and it was quite a, an ambitious uh, research program started at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and since then, it's had really highs and lows. So in the 80s, it was overtaken by nuclear. Every time really there's been a, a big oil crisis, it's kind of returned, um, kind of come back as a trend and then got overtaken by something else. So most recently, wind and solar. But in the 2000s, as a lot of you will know, it gained industrial traction. Companies like Calamis and Aquamarine, you know, big Scottish flagship uh, in, in the world, you know, pioneers in the world of wave energy, um, 
built and deployed very large utility scale machines. So these were huge devices, thousands of tons, very expensive. And the leap was a little bit too much. So the, they, they didn't really have a chance to iterate their designs to make them cost competitive and to introduce enough innovation. So they were massively innovative, but just fell a little short. Um, and so, so we're trying to do things a little bit differently. So we're trying to commercialize from the small scale and then uh, we'll see it through the roadmap. Um, try to make that leap a little bit less big and give ourselves a little bit more time to uh, both in terms of learning and the revenues to gradually scale up across different markets. So as a company, um, we kind of are involved from the concepting to putting devices in the water. We work with a lot of uh, partners and subcontractors. So by no means do we do it all ourselves. We get a lot of help. Um, but our, one other thing that differentiates Motion is the design process. So the company itself was built on um, uh, an optimization routine. So this is essentially um, about cycling through numerically a lot of different geometries for a given site. So you have a particular wave resource. You try lots of different geometry combinations to see what geometry gives you, maximizes or minimizes, depending on your objective, a particular target. So what's desirable? A lot of the time, what's desirable is getting maximum energy for a given amount of mass of machine, where that mass is kind of giving you a sense of the, uh, is a proxy for cost. So um, energy per cost. And so there's AI-based, artificial intelligence-based algorithms that I have to admit I don't really understand very well, but I, we have a very good numerical modeling team. Um, and something that was involved in my PhD was uh, validation testing. So we first do this at the small scale. So we go to the wave tank and we make sure that the behavior that we're modeling numerically is in fact reproduced physically. Um, and ultimate validation obviously happens in the real sea, and we're lucky to have got to that point and to have a device in the water again. And we've actually got Jan and Tom here today who were offshore earlier and are uh, maintain and operate um, our device, Blue X. So just to give you a sense of the impact of geometry and on, on wave energy, um, on energy capture. So on the graph, we've plotted power per mass on the vertical axis and then the wavelength of the waves on the horizontal axis. And we're comparing a sort of standard symmetrical hinge raft. So that's the orange or reddish line um, to what the blue X geometry really, which is asymmetry. And then these slope sections at the front and rear uh, that we call wave channels. And so you can see that not only does your peak go up, but also your bandwidth gets broader. So you're able to be sensitive to a wider range of waves. And this means overall, it's what we talked about earlier. So it's about being able to convert the, the widest range of conditions so that you get, you can convert the energy from a lot of the waves that you're seeing throughout the year. So having a very narrow peak means you get loads of energy when conditions are like that specifically. Uh, but it's all about the, the area under the graph, essentially. And that's particularly important when you uh, use wave energy for off-grid applications, where you're actually, you're delivering power locally to equipment offshore. And a lot of the time that's about delivering continuous power, as opposed to caring about how much power overall in the year that you get. It's about being able to consistently deliver a set amount of power. Okay, so as you're probably aware, very crowded landscape, many concepts, not many successes commercially. Um, the, let's say the three kind of wave theory in three lines will probably be wave energy is transferred in orbits. There is more energy close to the surface and less as you go deeper down uh, and the longer waves carry more energy. So those are the kind of the three things to keep in mind. So these are just some of the concepts that have arisen over time. 
and a question that different stakeholders from investors even internally to to wave developers is you know which technology is best how can we tell and thankfully recently over the last couple of years some industry um, standards have emerged that are now internationally recognized um, and wave energy scotland was very much involved in this process as many as well as other organizations um, and these are now formalized into this framework from the International Energy Agency and OES stands for Ocean Energy Systems and is one of the technology programs within the IEA. So having this kind of set of standardized uh, areas of evaluation helps us to compare devices and also helps Wave Energy Scotland and other programs that um, assign public funding or private investors who are deciding where to invest their money to have a framework that they can use to say, okay, this technology looks, is performing better than this other one. And this is what we've gone through. We've gone through six stage gates where we've been assessed based on these metrics versus other companies to access the public grants that we've received. Um, and we'll talk about the specific, the Web Energy Scotland program and then the Europe Wave program a little bit later on. Okay, I'll, I'll whiz through this. We talked about, so it's a, it's a floating asymmetric hinge raft. That's the core technology. The waves are causing a relative pitching of the two holes. We have a generator in the hinge, and then we, we are damping. So we're breaking the mechanical torque that is converting the mechanical to electrical energy that is exported via cable. Um, and just a, a couple of things to point out there. I guess the deployability and the survivability are some of the key features. So in terms of deployability, again, we've talked about this broad bandwidth means you can extract energy in a lot of different locations, lots of different types of wave resource. And we're getting capturing energy from waves three times as long as the machine, which is fairly unusual. Usually it's about a one to one for these kinds of devices. The self-referencing behavior is significant. And so the device is moored from the front of the forward hull. And that hull is relatively stable. So we're not actually reacting against the moorings to convert our power. So the moorings are less stressed. And it also means they can be simpler and we can go to deeper water because we don't have to, for example, drill into the seabed and then have a tort system. And a lot of the point absorbers, so the buoys require that. We have a pretty simple catenary mooring uh, with drag embedment or uh, gravity anchors. And in terms of survival, the, the machine is passively survival, which means we don't have to do any active control of the machine when conditions get more extreme. So we remotely, the, um, the generator remotely disconnects when um, hinge speeds overcome certain thresholds and the holes are free to flex. They're free to move in the wave. So they either contour the waves or when the waves get steep, they duck, the machine ducks under the waves to shed the loads like, if, I don't know if anyone here surfs, I'm a pretty bad surfer myself, but one of the first things you learn is that when you're swimming past breaking zone, you wanna duck under the waves and not go over them. Um, okay, my final slide before handing back to John. What does this mean in terms of our roadmap? So we, we've started at the small scale, so tens of kilowatts and Blue X is the prototype. There's gonna be a lot of blues today so I, I apologize blue x is the prototype of our first commercial machine which is called blue star and this is delivering tens of kilowatts and the applications are power in situ so power locally to where it's needed offshore this might be for carbon capture and storage sensors enabling residential robotics um, or marine awareness or oil and gas lots of different uses we're looking at commercially deploying our first Blue Star machine in 2025. And then the learning that we're getting from having a machine in the water and hopefully the revenues that we'll start to see um, are helping us to scale up. So the technology is scalable in device size and in number, so in moving to arrays. So now that we're close to commercial with Blue Star, we've started developing the next size up Blue Horizon. So this is a the first machine is a 250 kilowatt device that we're developing through a program called Europe Wave, which I'll come to at the end. 
and the use cases for this one of the markets are islands and small um, and remote communities so where you have relatively low energy consumption but relatively high energy costs but also other demand markets like aquaculture um, and powering small platforms and so we're looking at commercial projects in 2027 and then ultimately the grid scale so um, we're seeing wave energy as having potential in combined wind wave farms now this concept is emerging more and more and to be honest more from the wave developers side than the wind side so offshore wind you may know is already having enough challenges as it is and so this idea is more of a technology push from the wave energy side to say well look we have big gaps between the wind turbines you know we think of the sea as being this infinite space but actually there is a lot of competition for offshore space so can we better utilize the space that we have offshore but also we, we're improving our lcoe um and that, there's studies coming out now that are um that are supporting this i'll hand back to john Right, so um, a little bit about what we've been up to so far. Um, Blue X, which is uh, the prototype device that we have built. Um, 2016 to 2019 was the, uh, the design phase for this device, um, which was designed in Edinburgh, where we're based. Funded by Wave Energy Scotland, uh, which was founded in 2015 by the Scottish Government. Um, and we were funded through their novel wave energy converter program, uh, which essentially had three competitive procurement rounds. First of all, to develop a concept. I think about 37 companies applied um, and about nine, eight or nine went through to this round. Um, secondly, front end engineering and design. So development of that concept. Uh, and finally, we were successful through to round three, which was detailed design, which ultimately led to a build and test. So 2019, 2020, uh, we started building our device in, in uh, sunny Fife. Uh, there's a few pictures here, 2020, there are um, there's some pictures of the separate sections of the device under fabrication in Cowden Beef. Uh, you can see the four sections there um, as two of the wave channels and then uh, the front uh, section and the aft section all, all separate. Um, 2021, there's the, uh, the various sections uh, out in the open at uh, Fourth Ports in Recife, uh, ready for ready for welding together. And Towards the, toward, further into 2021, um, structural completion at, at Fourth Port. So there's a nice picture of the device in the snow. Um, and of course, we also worked through the, the challenges of COVID as well. So um, that it, it took us a little bit longer to build the device than we've been originally anticipating. Um, 2020, 2021, uh, there is the a picture of the inside of the of the generator so fitting out you can see there the c gen generator on the left hand side here um it's a technology that was developed by the university of edinburgh uh, and it's quite suited to high torque low speed applications so quite well suited to wave energy 15 to 1 gearbox in between that and the drivetrain that connected through to the hinge so for each small rotation of the hinge, there's a 15 times larger rotation of the generator. And we also fitted out uh, the main hull with various bits of equipment, uh, batteries, control cabinets, um, ventilation systems, uh, and uh, a rectifier to uh, convert the uh, AC power to DC. 2021, ready for Orkney. Uh, the device sitting there on press day on the quayside in Recife. 
have to run you through a few of the main bits. Um, that's the forward wave channel. So that shows, obviously it's not in the water, but it shows the, the wave direction should it be in the water. Mooring points. So um, it is moored from the, the front end, from the front wave channels. Lifting points does what they say on the tin. There's the aft wave channel at the back. Uh, the nacelle, which houses the generator that you saw you know, in an earlier image. Uh, the comms tower, so that we can communicate with the device, so we can monitor it and control it remotely. And an access hatch, so we can get inside it when we need to. It's going to work. Yeah, there we are. Lovely little animation. Scapa flow. Scapa flow is familiar uh, to everyone here, I'm sure. Uh, we decided to uh, test our device, first of all, at Scapa flow in, uh, in 2021. Benefits of doing that, um, obviously, it's an EMAC site, so it's already leased from the Crown Estate, which is a, a big advantage. Um, it's sufficiently sheltered, uh, so suitable for testing operations and maintenance for the first time in a relatively controlled environment. Um, while at the same time, once a month, roughly, still experiencing pretty decent um, you know, weather, weather conditions to put the device through its paces. And also the EMAC support that comes with deploying at EMAC, uh, including there's a wave rider boy there, which measures wave data for us. So before we install the device, we uh, install the moorings. And there's a wee diagram of the moorings there. There are basically two legs with a bridle in the middle and a swivel, and two subsurface buoys and gravity anchors. So basically the subsurface buoys uh, cause the mooring system to act as a spring, so there aren't there isn't snatch loading on the device, uh, and the swivel allows the device to to weather vanes. And there's a wee, uh, wee image on the right hand side there of some of the mooring components being loaded onto loose marines vessel uh, ready for deployment. Meanwhile, uh, Blue X's journey to Scapa Flow. Uh, on the left there, there's there's Fluex ready for transport at Recife. Um, there's a little bit of an out with the old, in with the new photo there. So in the back, there's a, an oil platform getting ready for decommissioning, out with the old. And in the foreground, there's Fluex, the shining new technology of the future. Um, there's a photo of uh, Fluex being uh, ready for lifting into the water uh, in, in Orkney. Um, it's already been uh, wet chested down in Recife by this point. Uh, and then under tow to scatter flow to be hooked up to the mooring system. So sea trial wise, um, so we have a snapshot of a computer screen there. Um, this is what my colleague Jan over here gets to look at day in, day out uh, to essentially make sure that the machine is behaving itself. It enables us to monitor the machine and to control it. Um, there's a few little buttons on the rest on the left hand side that enable us to switch on, switch it off. And then uh, lots and lots of instrumentation inside, far far more than there will be in a commercial device. But it, it it's it's a it's a science experiment at this point. So it enables us to monitor the device. So there we are a couple of couple of key monitoring Parameters at the top there, instantaneous power, how much power is it producing? Um, so at Scapa Flow, we were getting power peaks up to around 30 kilowatts. And then uh, this little square on the left hand side, hinge position, that tells us uh, what angle the actual hinge is, is sitting at at any moment in time. And the other advantage of Scapa Flow, when, when, uh, when there aren't so many waves, uh, we can get safe access um, to the device at sea in sea states below half a meter, and we can get inside it. We can perform inspections, do maintenance, and such like. 
So 2021 SCAPA learnings, uh, power production, we prove the device's capability to deliver sustained power production. Pretty much 100% communications uptime. So we were constantly able to, to see the device, see how it was performing and communicate with it. It survived. It's a pretty good measure of wave devices. Are they still sitting on the top of the water at the end of the, of the trial? Um, so it survived diving through waves to shed loads um, and entering survival mode in extreme conditions. Reliability, nothing major failed. That's another pretty good measure. Um, and operations and maintenance. So it's not just about does it work, but can we can we install it, remove it, access it, monitor it, control it? Um, all pretty important. It's you know you don't know you can do those things until you put it out in the water and try. And we're we're a big fan of you know trying by doing. Uh, also, the technology is proven to um, technology readiness level six. So this is a fairly the TRL level is fairly commonly used by industry. There's a couple of scales actually, um, but on this scale. Level six means we've demonstrated the system prototype in an operational environment. So that's pretty important to funders and investors and so on. We video of the device bobbing about in Scapa Flow, and you can see the aft uh, rising up and down, the forward section staying relatively a bit stiller, and a few waves coming through. Big, big-ish waves, not huge in scapper flow, but big enough to, to exercise the device. You can see the hinge doing its thing there. And that's a, a bit of a seasick making wet eye view of the same thing. This was taken by a remote camera, so don't worry, there wasn't someone standing on the top taking a video. Um, but that's the same the same footage from the from the uh, eye of the machine, as it were. I'm particularly fancy being on that at that particular moment. So, marching forward a couple of years, um, renewable for subsea power. This is a project we're currently involved in, um, funded through the Net Zero Technology Centre in Aberdeen. Uh, quite a number of project partners. There's a bit of a logo fest at the bottom there, but you can see all the various parties who are involved. Um, the project really is to deploy a first of a kind system with the Blue X device, a subsea battery, and an AUV, which is an unmanned autonomous vehicle, to prove continuous power and communication offshore. Uh, it's been out in the water since February this year. Um, it's a 12 month demonstration that we're running at the moment, so through until early next spring. Uh, it's located three and a half nautical miles east of the Orkney mainland. I'll show you a map in a minute, in about 50 meter depth of water. Um, and it's, as I say, demonstrating remote comms control and monitoring. Aims of the project really for us are to boost industry confidence in the technologies, particularly this puts the device out at sea in the winter, which in, in a real North Sea environment. And to pave the way to carbon mitigation for carbon capture, storage, oil and gas, and other sectors. I know it sounds slightly perverse, possibly, oil, oil and gas being in there, but decarbonizing the oil and gas industry is. is amongst other aims. So on the diagram on the, on the right there, you can see the Blue X uh, wave energy converter at the top there. Uh, an umbilical, which provides power and comms from the, the wet to the, to the halo battery on the seabed. Um, halo battery on the bottom, supplied by a company called Volume. And Transmark, have supplied a an AUV, so a, a residential autonomous underwater vehicle, which sounds pretty cool and it is pretty cool. Um, so this time we've deployed off uh, the east coast of Orkney, just sort of southwest of, of Coppensea. 
Um, obviously, ideally, we'd like to test your EMEC, but there are there have been some benefits of deploying um, at this particular site. Um, first of all, Bluex was designed and scaled for the North Sea environment. Uh, so, you know, the, the wave climate and, and the specific wavelengths and, and heights that are experienced in the North Sea. So it's less suited to, be, to uh, Emax Billy Accrued site. Uh, it's a good depth, 50 meters. It's a site that's away from regular marine traffic routes and from fishing areas, which is pretty important in, in terms of, of sharing marine space. Uh, it's sufficiently exposed to real North Sea conditions, which is pretty fundamental uh, to, to raising industry confidence. And it's near enough to shore for access and maintenance. It's still a prototype, you know, it's still, that's, that's important to remember. And so we've, we've leased the site uh, from the Crown Estate for up to five years. We don't anticipate, anticipate using it for five years, but we have it. We have an option for that for that period. Um, so, what are the benefits of deploying the device with a battery? Little graph on the left hand side there that gives a, set, a sense of uh, kind of daily, monthly, and uh, annual variations in power output from just the wave energy converter itself. Pretty, pretty spiky. You add a battery into the mix, and then you essentially pretty much guarantee that the power is always available. So quite quite a big quite a big change. Highlights from this project. Uh, so we've been there about seven months um, so far. So far we've got robust wave and solar yields. You can see we actually added some solar panels onto the uh, onto the device there. Um, it's free real estate uh, in the summer. If it's less wavy, it's more sunny. So it's a pretty ideal match of technologies. Um, key outcomes so far generated about five megawatt hours of, of power. Encountered seven meter waves in Storm Babette quite recently, which is what's that, 22 feet in old money. Um, pretty decent sized waves. Uh, we've done about 50 autonomous docks and undocks of the of the AUV. So we've demonstrated we can communicate with that and control it. And the solar contribution uh, is covered more than the, the demand of the of the comm system. So the main purpose of solar is to is to ensure that the communications stay active and it's it's more than achieve that. So this time there's a bit of camera footage during Storm Babette waves uh six meters something of that order is about right then um there we are that's more like it isn't it that's 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 better footage that really puts uh puts the device through its paces and you see the off section coming up down there um that's re that's really what we're doing this for true survivability in these sorts of conditions pretty cool footage So why why Orkney? Um, infrastructure, uh, EMAC, ready consented sites, really helpful. Develop developer support, really helpful. Great connection uh, when we come to the to um, Andreas' uh, final set of slides. You'll see why that will become important as well. Um, good harbour infrastructure. Um, Good harbours at, at both Hatston Pier for uh, north and east coast of Orkney and at um, Copland Dock for, for um, Scapa Flow and Billy Accru. Variety of wave climates. Um, we've got a nursery site at Scapa Flow, North Sea wave climate to the east, and uh, Billy Accru gives us a, a west coast Atlantic wave climate. Um, supply chain. Um, experienced marine contractors and good consultancies. Excellent availability of services and materials, particularly for an island of 20,000 population. Pretty incredible, I think. Uh, and another major benefit, it's, it's a welcoming place to stay, to live and to work. 
Uh, I've got a pretty soft spot for Orkney. I did my master's at ICIT at, in Stromness and lived there for a year and lived up here again for six months when we were deploying the device. And it, it's a fantastic place to work. Um, and yeah, supply chain, uh, there's plenty of logos missing off there, but I think it just goes to show the number of companies that are based in Orkney that are able to help us develop our technology, um, which has been hugely appreciated. So I'll hand back to Andrea, who's going to uh, talk a little bit about our future projects. And then after that, we'll take any questions, but just to Andrea first. Thank you. So this is a much shorter section. So we're almost at the end. Um, a snapshot about what we're thinking about doing, what we're working on right now, right now, uh, looking ahead. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, Blue Star, small scale, we're close to getting it in the water on a commercial project, hopefully um, over the next year or so. The mid scale is and the grid scale, we kind of bunch them and we, this is a blue horizon technology. So we're starting at the mid scale, looking at, as I said, islands and remote communities. Um, we have been successful in getting to the end. So we found out at the end of summer, we reached the final phase of another competitive pre-commercial procurement program, similar to WES, um, which is called EuropeWave. So we were awarded uh, just over 3 million pounds in grant funding. And this really is a, a 33 month phase. So it will take us from about now until the end of 2026. And this is to build, uh, so do the detailed design, build a full scale, first of a kind machine, uh, which we will do with Texo in Dundee. So they were the fabricators that worked with Orbital Marine on the tidal, the big floating tidal um, double turbine device. Um, we'll be then towing the device up to Billia Crew and doing a minimum 12 month at sea trial and really bringing that scale of technology to the point where we are now with, with Blue X. So up to um, commercial scale, single device demonstration. Obviously, when we look to these markets that are not off grid, so early grid projects um, and islands, we are dealing with a wider range of stakeholders um, and these are going to be really really sizable projects and so as motion you know what we do well is we is developing the technology what we are learning to do and what we will be um, doing a lot more of um, in the future is the project development side the stakeholder engagement events like this where we tell people about what we plan to do get feedback um, and get and incorporate that into into our development programs. And so, yeah, arrays is going to be part of that. So expanding from single devices to arrays post 2026 and 2027, which is when the Europe Wave program ends. Again, similarly to the renewables for subsidy power projects, where we've involved industry partners for for the integration side of things. So, what's really crucial in that project is not only showing that there's a wave energy converter and it's it's working it's delivering power but it's also being able to tie that to the other elements of the puzzle that are required to decarbonize offshore infrastructure so the battery the AUVs the sensors the control systems etc and we would not be able to do that just ourselves as a company so that's why we have you know a technology integrator operators and other partners so we're looking to incorporate that model at this scale as well. So we're, the full program actually is more expensive than three million pounds, which is probably unsurprising because we're building a, a machine that is you know 50 meters long, 400 tons. It's a big piece of kit. And so part of what we're doing, part of what I'm doing for the next six months is to find at least three commercial industry partners um, to, to work with. So to participate in the project, to bring funding and in-kind support, whether it's equipment, cable, other things, bits of design, um, to support the sort of the full, the full program over the next two and a half years. So um, I won't run through this whole slide. I mean, the device looks not too dissimilar from Blue X. It's still got the two, the two holes, the asymmetry, the hinge, the wave channels. 
you'll notice the the power takeoff systems now there's two so we have a bit of redund redundancy at the, these two side pods a key bit of innovation in this program is the power takeoff system so we're developing a new type of generator called a vernier hybrid machine or vhm um, and this really is even better suited to the slow speed high torque and also reciprocating motion that we're seeing with this kind of device and a lot of wave energy devices and that's a real challenge because generators i you know the vast majority of generators out there uh, have been developed for high speed low torque mono direction so that's a big part of what we're doing other bits of innovation as well a quick quick connect system to facilitate connection and disconnection a lot of uh, a lot more work now going into arrays um, and things like shared moorings and wet clusters um, and we can see sort of the scale of the machine is roughly to scale so the the vhm uh, the generators on the bottom right and then the, there's a little man near the wave a little person near the front wave channel there and we're coming back to Orkney. So <clears throat> the Europe Wave project offered two different test sites. EMEC was one and BIMEP in the Basque country was the other one. We select, we chose uh, EMEC as our preferred site because we have experience here. Um, we have had good experiences here um, and we want to continue to, to run projects at EMEC beyond the beyond this Europe Wave program. So beyond the end of 2026, with an eye to expanding our single device deployment to a smaller array, so three or four devices. So for Europe Wave, we'll be at birth three, um, and that's mandated by the program. Uh, we didn't really get a choice there. We're considering a slight extension of the cable that is there to be able to access slightly deeper water. And we are talking to EMEC about what happens after that um, trial. So beyond 2026, our preferred berth would be berth five because it's deeper water. We can hopefully get some revenue support mechanisms. Uh, so the rocks, the renewable obligation certificates, so that will be positive and that they're, they're not present at berth three, but we will see. So we have to figure out um, and map out the different scenarios. but. Whatever happens, it's likely that we'll be at EMEC uh, beyond 2026. A little bit on environmental monitoring. So the, really the key takeaways of this slide are, we did some environmental monitoring when we did our SCAPA flow deployment. And there we worked with two universities of Plymouth and Exeter. Um, and we were monitoring for displacement, physical harm uh, through noise and collisions and changes to habitat. So for example, introducing non-native species. We did that through acoustic surveys, and then we had baited cameras, both mid column and at the seabed, seabed samples. Um, and as is very typical of these kinds of programs, we did a baseline assessment and then a, a post-installation monitoring, looking at different receptors from marine mammals to invertebrates to birds. And happily, no negative impacts were identified. And we've included now an environmental work stream into the Europe Wave program, where we're working with the University of the Highlands and Islands um, and uh, the Environmental Research Institute there, um, led by Benjamin Williamson. And so um, that's going to be a bigger part of what we do going forward with this bigger device, particularly because you know the roadmap is taking us towards a raise, and so um, it's an even more fundamental uh, part of the program. It, the WEC is fairly slow moving. It's really two moving parts. They move relatively slowly. Um, we don't see that as a major issue, for example, for collision or physical harm or noise. But as ever, you know, we want the data and the evidence to be able to reassure different stakeholders that that really is the case and ourselves as well. So looking ahead, really mentioned this. So there's a picture of John in a hard hat with um, some other guys at Texo. So we're just kicking off phase three of Europe Wave now. Gonna put it in the water. So it's gonna be in the water nominally between 2025 and 2026. Program will end in 2026. And we're just to expand from there. So beyond, so beyond the small array demonstrator, we are looking at 
potentially accessing CFDs, the contracts for difference um, for around 2030. So that has a little bit of um, lead up. So um, over the next couple of years, we'll be seriously considering putting applications in. And we're really grateful to be working with uh, an advisory panel who are really giving up some of their time. This is in kind support. And really, and actually, we're lucky to have one of them. Lara is here. Um, and so this really for us is about, you know, motion is growing and it's growing quite quickly, but we know what we're good at. We know what we're less good at or have less experience of. So technology development is what we've, we've done so far. But as we get, we expand our projects and we go through our roadmap, um, we know that we'll need to cover more of the project development, stakeholder engagement, the energy justice side of things the integration elements um, and so and, and the environmental monitoring. So Benjamin Williamson is there as well. Um, and so it's it's really key for us to really start engaging um, and engaging properly with a, a wider range of stakeholders. So we're really grateful to them. So they we started that in phase two and we're continuing in, in phase three. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Orkney, as well. Uh, thank you very much to John and Andrea there for a really interesting and in-depth presentation about motions activities here in Orkney and their plans for the future. Uh, there is some time now for questions, if anybody has any burning questions that they want to ask. For those in the room, yeah, please put your hand up and we've got a roving mic that we can pass around. And for those online, if you could put your hand up on Zoom and again, we'll answer the questions um, via that mechanism as well. Yep, really happy to answer questions. I should say motion is quite uh, has has a broad spectrum of specialities within it, and Andre and I don't necessarily cover all of them. So, so we'll try our best to answer the questions. So how will you incorporate the opinions of local fishermen, and how you will you make sure in your future development project? The local fishermen's concerns and voices are heard and implemented. And uh, I didn't see from any of your previous lectures that uh, you mentioned anything about consultations on the fishermen's, and also you should continue a fisherman in your advisory panel, you know, because the fisherman is what you need to advise you on the future development of the of the this amazing project. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I mean, thank you. Yeah, important question. Um, so when we apply for any lease or, or license, uh, there's a statutory process. Um, and part of that statutory process is um, to uh, seek feedback and input from the fishing community, which is in this case is usually through Orkney's Fisheries, or Orkney Fisheries Federation and uh, SFF, the Scottish Fisheries Federation. Um, most of our, well, our future deployments are likely to be at EMAC at Billy Accru for the foreseeable future, which of course has already gone through that, that process. Um, but nevertheless, what we'll be looking to do is to undertake, um, as well as that strategy process, soft consultation with, with fisheries as well as, as we head towards longer term larger deployments i don't know if that answers your question that's quite a standard question how will you incorporate artificial int intelligence into your future project and uh, what do you think uh, about uh, the value of your data how the data how will you use the data collected in the trail project for the future development of the project and uh, how would you maximize the value of your data will you use the data as a resource for example will you sell your data to other company in the you know like wave energy to gain perfect what will be the usage of your data how do you maximize the values of your data thank you yes so an, an ai question and a data question so I think it's is it would it be fair to say, Andrea, that the Blue Insight, which is our software that we already use to optimize the devices, is in effect 
AI? Is that too much of a too much of a bold statement? I mean, you you're speaking to two non-experts with AI, first of all. So I'll caveat I'll caveat the response that way. So in the optimization um, routine, we use meta heuristic algorithms. So these are things like um, uh, genetic genetic algorithms. Yeah. yeah, but so that's a form of AI, right? I mean, AI is this forever ballooning. Uh, area and figuring out the best way of utilizing it will be really important for us because i mean jan will testify to the fact that we get huge huge amounts of data from our machine in the water and just being able to process that data to make the most use out of it ourselves is a challenge in terms of resources in terms of time and it's really fundamental right i mean that's really what's motivated our pathway is to get in the water sooner and get that data from having steel in the water so i don't yeah i don't have the answer but it's certainly an area that we we've, we've been looking at and the technology r d team is considering in terms of how do we make the most use out of it the sharing of data is another big topic in the wave energy world so it's you know it's thus far there's been a tendency to you know, patent and the very IP sort of protection heavy. Um, and we've seen even with some title companies that, you know, they've, they've shut shop with no one being able to actually make use of the technology. Something that Wave Energy Scotland did and did very effectively was, and this was really the, the genesis of Wave Energy Scotland and the reason why it was created by the, the Scottish government back in 2014 was to essentially buy up the IP from Calamis, Aquamarine, and other companies that had gone under and to preserve it and to reutilize it. So that data is openly available. If you go on the Wave Energy Scotland website, you can access the reports and use that data. Um, as, as an approach, Motion kind of sees, you know, any success, any commercial success in the Wave Energy world, whatever company it comes from, is a success for the sector and is good for the whole sector. Obviously, you have to kind of tread the fine line between sharing enough and oversharing. And over -sharing. Um, but that's sort of the way we approach it. I, I, like, I like the way on the one hand you said you're not an expert and then use the term meta heuristic algorithm in the same <laughs> sentence. <laughs> Yeah. So we've got a question online, which we'll move to Martin first off and then back into the room. Martin. Okay, I'd like to ask uh, how you deal with the very short term power fluctuations, uh, which can cause power quality issues. I know that uh, some previous machines used intermediate uh, compressed uh, gas storage in order to smooth out those power variations. How is it done on this machine, please? Short, uh, the very short answer is batteries. Um, there are 30 kilowatt hours of battery, 33, 33 yeah. kilowatt hours of battery storage on the on the device. Um, so uh, we, we've been pretty keen to keep the system electro mechanical and as simple as possible. And, and batteries is a fairly straightforward way of doing that. So yeah, battery storage on board. We're likely to in increase the battery storage on future devices. And as you've seen in the RSP project, also battery storage on the seabed is, a, is an option as well. Um, I also have two questions. Maybe I'll ask one first. Um, you've shown us Blue X and Blue Star. Um, are they of similar scale? Because that wasn't very clear. And can you share anything about what kind of peak power you reached with the testing so far? Uh, so, yeah, first question. Yeah, good, good question. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So, so Blue Star, same size as Blue X, roughly double the power, just from continuous improvement and the learnings that we've had with Blue X. Um, slightly heavier, I think it's going to be in the region of ten, five to ten tons heavier. Um, so, in terms of power rating, saying twenty kilowatts, power rating is a bit of a an amorphous uh concept so you always have to kind of open the bonnet and actually look at 
power rating with capacity factor or of course continuous available power if that's the application you're using it for um AP annual energy production if that's what you're caring about um for your second question um really whether there's a, whether there's anything you can share or present about what kind of peak power you've achieved with the testing so far so scalper flow which was relatively sheltered mm -hmm. uh we've got instantaneous peaks of 30 kilowatts i okay. i'm not sure but maybe jan do you know yeah i think maximum we'll ever get instantaneous um so that's the same for scalper and for sites the um, i think the maximum continuous power output is probably close to like five kilowatts okay because that's like the smoothest probably can get could get more in the ideal conditions so yeah, you're, and you're hoping to get roughly twice that with the production version yeah right yeah but 30 kilowatts i think is is the instantaneous peak because that's when to protect the power electronics mm -hmm. basically when you get the over speeds you, you you trip the pto so it kind of disconnects to preserve the power electronics yeah. So if you didn't have that mechanism, you'd probably see higher spikes. Mm. Um, it's probably and fair, it's not yeah. necessarily the case that you would get double with blue stuff because what you, you might be getting those peak at the rarer rare events where you get the larger waves that aren't actually giving you contributing that much to the overall energy. Yeah. You're, you're so you're looking right. at similar peaks probably, but hopefully more in the slightly lower seas. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's fair, it's fair to say that, you know, I guess the numbers don't sound big. Um, so the kind of customer demand for the smaller blue star scale device really is is largely in the single digit kilowatts it's really about having reliable constantly available power rather than large amounts of power that's fair enough um whereas you know you double the length step up to blue horizon size and, and there's a fairly exponential increase in, in power output um, so for, for, for Blue X and Blue Star, the numbers sound quite small and people go, oh, that's, you know, quite a, a low, quite a high levelized cost of energy. Um, but that's not really the metric. The, me the metric is, can you provide power in small quantities, but all the time yes, in, yeah, in, yeah. in remote locations where providing that power by some other means, like running umbilicals for tens of kilometers is really, really expensive. So. Um, I let other people have a go and I'll come back at this at this time. Thanks. I was just wondering, you were saying that the machine that you've got was optimised for the the wave conditions. Is is there much of a difference between the North Sea waves and the Atlantic waves? And have you you know are you looking at a different machine for the Atlantic? I think it's fair to say I'll, I'll I'll say it quickly in my project you win, and then Andrea will probably expand on it in a technical sense. But uh, North Sea quarter waves um, not as great a wave height, therefore smaller machine, shorter machine. Uh, Atlantic longer waves, longer machines essentially. Is that a fair? Yeah, in a nutshell. Yeah. So so the for the type of applications that we're looking at. At the blue star scale, sort of the tens of kilowatts, we wouldn't be putting it in an Atlantic climate, to be honest. Um, so, you know, it's from a survivability point of view. I mean, we haven't got to the bottom of it. It's not the case that it might that it won't survive necessarily, but it doesn't have to survive those climates because th that's not really where the use cases are. So, a lot of the use cases are within the North Sea Basin and other regions like. You know, Gulf of Mexico, west coast of Africa, west coast of Australia, other places like that. So you would be significantly over designing to provide that level of power. On the other hand, with Blue Horizon, it is absolutely targeting the types of wave climates like Billy Crew. So very exposed, longer waves, higher wave heights. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi there, interesting talk. Thank you very much. Um, I was actually just wondering whether you'd been monitoring the footprint on the seabed whilst it's in research and development stage, and if that is being monitored on temporal scale. 
on what scale, sorry? So over time, over scale, time, time for time. projects, so over the different seasons sure. to monitor the impact over a wider time scale? I mean, the, the short answer is it's not something we've been doing at length so far. I mean, the, the impact, I mean, the footprint on the seabed is quite small. It's basically gravity anchors um, or concrete blocks, essentially, at the moment. Um, interesting. I was just actually going to ask as well yeah. what kind of scale of that impact or that imprint actually is and whether you see any um kind of scouring or impact effect like directly underneath or how far away from the device that kind of expands out yeah, as that's well. A difficult question to answer. So in the scalper flow deployment, I believe we had cameras on the seabed. I'm not actually sure how frequently we were getting the data through if it was like a continuous five month video of data that we were getting. I don't think it was. Um, right now, the autonomous underwater vehicle is doing monitoring missions, but it's very ad hoc and, and occasional. It's not something we're monitoring consistently over extended periods of time. I think we will have, we will have to do that. Um, the sort of footprint area is, I think the mooring points right now are about 120 meters apart, something like that. Um, and one of the, besides the gravity basis, one of the other sort of standard solutions that we're looking at is dra drag embedment, which would create more, probably mm -hmm. more of those kinds of effects that we would have to monitor. And they've also moving chain on the seabed. So no, if, if yeah. you like, there's um, yeah, that's right. a 76 mil chain that runs along the seabed and then comes off. And as, as the device is, is pushed by the waves, that can lift. Off. So in a way, that that's probably the point of greatest impact. Um, we don't, as far as we're aware, and, and from kind of pre-deployment and post-deployment surveys, that the, the gravity anchors don't move, mm. but the, the chain will. I, and as I say, it's certainly something that through the the Blue Horizon deployment, uh, it's our plan to do. You know, it's expensive, but it's a bigger budget. Is to do a a, a kind of more comprehensive piece of environmental monitoring which we don't necessarily have to do from a statutory basis for a, a short, a shortish term prototype deployment, but that data will be really useful when it comes to actually deploying more devices at scale. We can, we can prove that impact. So. As, as you commercialize that and yeah. bring it into say the, the wind sector, like you were saying, having that data available. Exactly. Um, yeah. It would be really beneficial. Exactly. Especially then when you're upscaling the number of devices and talking about placement and then kind of like quantifying then kind of how that risk could you know totally i mean i think you know when, when it comes to you know full full eias and so on for, for bigger longer deployments you know that that data will be invaluable yeah just say the the data from the environmental monitoring data from the scalpel flow deployment is i didn't put the link on the slide but it is on the tfis at this PNNL. Um, I should I'll, maybe I'll put it in before the slides are shared, but it is accessible, so you can see, Fantastic. yeah, what the stresses that were monitored, what the re the receptors were, and the findings. Okay, yeah. I'll have a look. I'll look that thing. Sorry. Oh, it was like, like we we had to. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah. Um, it was one of the yeah. It was part of the way we need the Scotland program. But that's, again, in terms of the data sharing, that's why these kinds of, you know, PTP programs are really useful, yeah. not just for individual developers, but for the wider sector. So. Yeah, and it's not, it's not really any IP in that, really, particularly. Yeah, it, it's, it's useful, it's important, yeah. So, yeah, and uh, I mean, at the moment, with changes in how Marine Scotland are kind of um, developing their benthic monitoring as well, um, certainly looking at the whole uh, renewable development sector as a whole, rather than just looking at them, looking at them individually. Yeah, it's really beneficial to yeah. have this information to put into that pool of knowledge Definitely. as well to kind of drive those guidelines forward. It's certainly, you know, it's a step up that we want to take in our organisation to, to to focus more on environmental monitoring. Right at the start, we're really focused on technology. Yeah. Does it work? Yeah. Now, now we know it works. There's there's, there's a series. Taking that box, yeah, you can now start. You can start work. taking, and that and that's definitely a next a next step. Yeah. Thank you.
Any other questions before we wrap up? Any other questions online? Nothing coming through. No more hands. Last minute. Okay, well, just thank you very much again to John and Andrea for a really interesting yeah. presentation this evening. Um, yeah, I found it really fascinating, so I'm going to be watching the recording when it goes up online again to uh, remind myself of some points. Um, just a quick note on ORIF membership. So ORIF is a membership organisation um, here promoting um, Orkney as uh, the home of world leading renewable energy industry. Um, it, there is an introductory offer on at the moment until the end of the year of £10 uh, membership fee. So if you're not already a member and fancy joining, there is a membership form online um, that you can uh, sign up there. And that gives you free entry to all or ORF events, various networking opportunities throughout the year um, and various email updates as well. So I encourage you to sign up as a member if you've not already done so. Anyway, just, yeah, thank you very much to John and Andrea and to everybody for joining tonight. Thank you for having us.